Great to see everyone with us today. We appreciate you being here, having this opportunity to worship God together. That's great. Last week we finished the third lesson in our series entitled, Not the Way Things Are Supposed to Be. As we talked last week, it was about the corruption in our land. Now the first one was kind of an introduction to not the way things are supposed to be. The second one was the cleansing that we need to go through, spiritual hygiene. And last week was the corruption in our land. It is true that as a society, we are in need of cleansing. And it might actually come to us because we're willing to repent as a nation. It might come to us because God has extended that compassion to us or that in order that we may think, I need to make a change. And even if the nation doesn't do that, we individually can do that. But it may also come to us through the vengeance of God. I don't want it to be that way, but it could be. But I wanted to end last week's lesson by reminding the audience that no matter what the fate of this country is, and I appreciated Melvin's prayer, no matter what the fate of this country is, the church will last into eternity. Now, the definite article is there. The church will last. So no matter what is on the board out front, it can say that we are the church of Christ all day long. But we have to do what God has asked us to do in order to be that church. And that is the church that will be transplanted one day into heaven. And that's a guarantee from Scripture that even the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We need to hold firm to God's rule of authority if we want to be that church. The various acts that he's asked us to participate in as far as worship goes and do that in spirit and truth, we need to hold firm to that. If we want to be that church that's talked about in New Testament, then we need to keep Christ as the head of that church and exalt no man to that level. If we refuse to walk in that direction, but we walk contrary to those words, then we will not be that church. We have to obey what God says. Now, on the lesson for today, the gift of God. Romans 6.23 that Caleb just read, he did an excellent job. I'm going to go back over that scripture at this time. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So just one more time. For the wages, that's something that you have worked for. Of sin, that's transgressing God's law. That's missing the mark, is death. That's eternal separation from God. But then that little three-word conjunction, but... The free gift that was given willfully on the cross that came from God, the free gift of God is eternal life or everlasting life. Think about it. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. The blood that he shed on the cross was so that we can be redeemed with God. So within this verse you find two extremes. First, you find out that if you decide to walk contrary to God's word, not the way you're supposed to, then one day you'll reap or you will earn exactly what you've sown or labored for. Eternal death, total separation from God. However, secondly, and this is an important aspect of our study today, if you hold firm to God's word, if you stay on the path that he has designed, if you do what he's asked you to do, then there is a free gift. We did nothing to earn it. It's free to us. That we will receive, it is eternal salvation with our Lord and Savior in heaven for eternity. Now, heaven. I know it's metaphoric, the language that's used. But that is the only words that we can have that will satisfy our need to understand what it's going to be like. So when the Bible says 
streets of gold. I know that's metaphoric. Unless God wants it literally to be streets of gold, but it seems like it's probably metaphoric language. But wow, don't you want to see that? The pearly gate. Don't you want to see that? The jasper walls. The crystal sea. The mansion that he has prepared. I want to see those things. It's interesting to note that the word wages, according to the New American Heritage Dictionary that I have in my office, it says it's a fitting, now think about it, fitting return for something that has been worked for or something that is deserved. That definition fits perfectly with what Paul's trying to convey in Romans 6.23. It is a return on your investment. You've earned this. It is payment in full for your labor. If you've sinned and you continue to live in an unrighteous state, then you've earned your judgment. But if you've accepted, and when I say accepted, I don't mean just in word only. When I say accepted, I mean that you have followed God's plan and acknowledged Jesus Christ as our Savior. If you follow that plan, then the gift of God which is Jesus Christ, is there for you to receive. If you were willing to listen and obey him, if you had wandered away and was willing to be cleansed, then that gift is for you today. And that's pretty plain and that's pretty powerful in the scriptures. I've often told you that I'm a teacher, I'm not a judge. I stick to that. But sometimes I don't even have to be the judge. The sinner himself sometimes judges himself. I had a friend growing up who I went to church with, and right around age 14 he became a Christian. He was baptized. But by the time he was in his early 20s, 22 or so, he was not living a righteous life, but he was living a riotous life. And if you went up to him and called him by his name and ask him about that, he would say, I know if I die, I'm not going to make it to heaven. So he knew his lifestyle was contrary to what God's word said. Maybe he thought, well, a little bit down the road, I'll, I'll return. Maybe he just didn't care, I don't know. But at age 23, while flying back from his work in another state to Missouri, his plane crashed and he died. I don't have to judge him. In his mind, he already judged himself. With his own words, he said, he was in an unsaved condition. He was no longer following God's plan, the plan that gets us from this temporary life to that eternal life in heaven. And the Bible's filled with illustrations of those who struggle and do things the wrong way. And I'm so grateful that God put those things in his word. I'm so grateful that it's not just the positive things that we can learn great lessons from, but also sometimes the negative things so it helps us understand what we're not to do. Two people that jump out at me is King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. They really were just a mess. They did practically nothing right that I can find in scriptures. Eventually, this wicked couple, their lifestyle brought them down physically on earth. But at the same time that those wicked rulers, Ahab and Jezebel, were ruling over Israel, there was a spiritual giant prophesying in the name of God. This man was an upright man, perfect or fully mature spiritually, He was righteous. He was a loving man full of compassion. His name was Elijah. He had many run-ins with the king and queen, Ahab and Jezebel, along the way. He even became so scared at one time that he ran from the city and he hid in the countryside. But make no mistake about it, once he realized that he was in error for doing that, He quickly repented and returned to the city. Elijah was the 
polar opposite of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. The king and queen met with horrific deaths. But Elijah died in a unique way, or was carried away, I'll say, in a unique way. Through the whirlwind and a fiery chariot, he was taken to heaven. I don't know how all that works. I don't proclaim to know it. But it's different than you and I will die and leave this earth. It only happened one other time in scriptures. And it happened to a man that was perfect or mature spiritually. His name was Enoch. Way back before the flood, he was so righteous, God simply took Enoch one day. That's not the way Ahab and Jezebel met their fate. So, how did Elijah secure his salvation? What did he do that sealed the deal for him to be with God for eternity? There's probably more ways than these four or five ways that I'm going to make mention of. But I've noticed these four or five things in his life. First, I believe with all my heart, he kept God close to him. I think one of the biggest mistakes we make, we don't realize it, but I think we get tempted and we, by our own lust, allow ourselves to move away from God. But if we could just somehow keep God close to us, pull him near to us, I think it would be a great blessing in our life. The way we could do that, two ways. We can have that communication that we need to have with him that Elijah had with him. Elijah, Elijah sought his counsel. We need to be doing that through prayer. But we need to be reading about and accepting his counsel also through the study of God's word. Elijah may, to be, may have been a prophet, but Elijah also was a student. And we need never to forget. While we're on this earth, we always need to be students of God's word. Secondly, he was willing to listen and obey God. Now, he didn't know what Romans 10, 17 said because it hadn't been written yet. But he was living like he did. So then faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of God. Elijah was walking by faith. And not by sight. He didn't do that 25% of the time. He didn't do it 50% of the time. Nor did he do it 75% of the time. Elijah did it 100% of the time. And you said, well, 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 wait a minute. You said just a moment ago, Elijah one time went the wrong direction. And I did. That's the beauty of being cleansed. Elijah, when he made that journey back from the cave back to the city. That was a journey of repentance. We all need to be on that journey if we've gotten off the path. God took a great big eraser and just swooped it down and erased that sin that he had uh, participated in. That's exactly what he'll do for us. If we're willing to be cleansed, he'll erase our past. If, he, if we're willing to ask for forgiveness. Third, he knew that God was with him on this journey. Yes, there was that time again that he went the wrong direction. He didn't know God was with him then. didn't take him long to figure it out. He figured out that God was with him and he made that journey back. Do you ever get in that same condition in your life where you sometimes forget that God's with you? Do you forget God's watching over you? The world does it every day. The world forgets God's watching over them every day. When you turn on the TV and watch all the nonsense that's going on in this country today, and I was surprised to find out it's not just going on in this country, but other countries over the same issue. When you watch all of that, you can see the necessity that we have to get back to where we need to be. We're far, far away from where God would have us to be. Our journey needs to happen quick. It needs to happen right now. We all need to come back to where we should be. Elijah was also a true servant. You know, when I'm talking to you all, sometimes I'll say, 
We need to be humble, submissive, loyal, obedient servants. Well, that was in Elijah's life already. If I need an earthly example to look at, I can look at the life of Elijah and Christ. But I can look at Elijah and see he was humble. He knew what his role was as a prophet. He was submissive to God's will. He didn't fight it. He was submissive to it. And he was loyal to that cause. Even willing to die, he was loyal to that cause. He was certainly obedient to God and his word. That All of that allowed him to be transformed into one of the greatest prophets of all times. He didn't ask for that role, but that role came to him because he was willing to obey what God said to obey. And that's a beautiful thing about the life of Elijah. And also Elijah was in it for the long haul. He was not a fair-weathered friend. He had a job to do. He knew where God wanted him to be. And he secured that position and saw it through to the end. Now, regarding that last point, I wonder if we also have the same attitude as Elijah had. I really believe, I really believe that I am exactly where God wants me to be. I really believe that. At this time, at this place. When the going gets tough, I don't want to bail and run away from my responsibilities. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes it happens with me. Sometimes it happens with you. But if I really believe that I'm at this place where and I believe God wants me here. It may take quite a bit to get me removed from this place. It won't happen for any nonsense of a reason that I'll pull up roots and leave. It's going to have to be something that happens that forces me to do that. And I'm no superhero, believe me. And I wonder, do we have the same attitude that Elijah had? Are we willing to be so firmly rooted here at this place that we're committed to the cause of Christ and we're not planning on uprooting for any reason? We're going to see it through to the end. I hope the answer is yes. Don't get me wrong. I know there's times when it might be necessary to leave. But I'm not talking about those physical things that you can't control that come along. I'm talking about indecisiveness as to where my church home is and how dedicated I am to seeing us grow. So I want to close by talking just for a moment about worshiping God at this place in spirit and truth because Elijah understood that. That's a beautiful story found in John chapter 4 of the woman at the well. She came to that well. She just saw a man. She came to realize pretty quick that was a Hebrew man. It wasn't long after that she was calling him rabbi. Not too long after that she was calling him, I perceive that thou art a prophet. And then it hit her. This is not just a prophet. This is the Messiah. What did the woman at the well do? If I do talk tonight, we're going to talk about this. She ran back into town to tell others that she had found the Messiah. That's a beautiful story in the Bible. It talks about, though, in that story, it talks about this little phrase. God is spirit. And if we are to worship him, here it is, we must worship him in spirit and truth. We must worship him in spirit and truth. In the Bible, we have the Old Testament, the Old Law. We have the New Testament, the New Law. 
No one would try to argue that in the Bible, the old law is not the truth of God's word. None of us would. It is the truth of God's word. Everything that is talked about in there was the truth. And in the New Testament, we wouldn't try to argue that that's not the truth of God's word also. But we're told to rightly divide the word of truth. So the old law was for a reason, for a purpose, for those people back at that time. The new law is for us today, the New Testament. It's the new law that we are to abide by. But that's the truth of God's word. So when we came together today and we sang songs, we were abiding by the truth of God's word. When we prayed to God, we were abiding by the truth of God's word. When we participated in the Lord's Supper, we were abiding by his word, the truth of God's word. We were abiding by the truth of God's word when we laid by in store. We were abiding by the truth of God's word when we searched the scriptures, or as we're searching the scriptures. That is the truth of God's word. But have you ever considered the other part of that verse? You know, I think it might have kind of a double meaning, to be honest with you. I think it could be talking about, and let me work my way through this, in a general way, the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit inspired the word that we call the truth of God's word. And so I think there's a connection there with the Holy Spirit when it says spirit. But I don't think that's the main meaning of that word there. The main meaning of that word spirit there is that when we worship God and his truth, we must have the right attitude. We must have our heart in the right place as we're worshiping him. And failure to do that makes our worship not acceptable to God individually. If I worship him and do everything he's asked me to do, exactly the way that he's asked me to do it, but I have the wrong attitude when I'm doing that, I don't believe God accepted my worship that day. If I have the greatest attitude, but we're not doing things the way he's asked us to do through the various acts of worship, then I don't think God has accepted my worship that day. Because God is spirit. And if we are to worship him, we, are, we must worship him in spirit and truth. I want us to be in harmony with God. And I know you do too. I want the church, this church, to prevail against even the gates of hell. So in conclusion... Let's make sure that we continue to worship God in the truth of his word. Let's also make sure that we have the best, most positive attitude concerning those matters. Let's make sure that we receive the free gift of God, which comes through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's make sure that we follow that plan from this earth all the way up into heaven. Now, it could be today that there's one in the audience who has never begun that journey that leads them from this earth to heaven. I hope you realize that you can do that very thing today. I hope you realize, and I hope for a time now, maybe you've been thinking about this. And in your mind, you've thought, you know, I'm not sure why I'm not a Christian. Because I've come to Bible class all these years. My mom and dad have taught me. I grew up in the church, so to speak, and I've been thinking about this for a long, long time, but I just haven't taken that step yet. Well, today's the very day that you can begin that journey. You have that opportunity, and we're going to all come down when you come out after being baptized, and we're going to embrace you, tell you how much we love you, and we're going to be pulling from you for, for you from that point on. For those that have maybe did that years ago, but you've wandered away, you happen to be here today and you thought about that and you thought, I really want to get back to where I need to be. I need to have myself cleansed, spiritually speaking. I know I'm not living the way I'm supposed to. 
I want to start living the way God wants me to. I know I live in a corrupt society that surrounds me, but the church is my sanctuary. The church is the place I can go to be edified and then to tell others that story that changed my life. If you want to be renewed in that way, you have the opportunity to come to the front here. We'll, we'll pray for you. And listen to this. There'll be great rejoicing in heaven. For that which was lost has been found. If you want to respond, please do so as we stand and as we sing. Let's rise up.